I'm going to be talking about how uh, we actually implemented data contracts uh, in our analytics events system, talk a little bit about the why, uh, and get probably too detailed about the how. Um, so really quick, oh, that's not working. Um, before I do that, maybe just a little bit of business context around uh, whatnot and our startup and what we do. Uh, so we are a marketplace company, an e-commerce company. Um, our big flagship feature is live stream shopping. Uh, you can see from the video here, the way it works is you uh, download our app, you go join a live stream, there will be a seller who is broadcasting usually themselves live, uh, and they're selling something. And you as a user, you can buy whatever it is they're selling. There are a few different formats, but typically uh, you usually buy from them via an auction. So this is the end of an auction, and this is what you're seeing here. Um, we typically sell in uh, collectible and community-driven marketplaces like sneakers and uh, sports cards and Funko Pops and comic books and stuff like that. Uh, there are lots and lots of categories. I couldn't possibly name them all now. Um, and we were named the fastest growing marketplace in the United States for, uh, I think, two years in a row now. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's like the one minute business context of what, uh, what whatnot is. Um, now I can do the one minute, uh, the road so far with our data stack. Um, first of all, quick plug for our blog. We write quite a lot about all this stuff. So go check that out. There will be another post about this probably, uh, in a little bit. Um, <coughs> You know, the tools in our data stack, usual suspects, we use uh, we use Snowflake for our data warehouse, mostly an AWS shop. Uh, we use Dagster for orchestration. Uh, we use DBT for transformations in the warehouse. And uh, Segment and Kafka are the two that I'm going to be talking about really specifically today. That's how we do events uh, and analytics events. So when uh, an engineer is building a feature and they want to log things happening, users tapping on uh, certain things or users placing orders, that kind of event, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, just like some context uh, on, on the data stack itself, uh, I think Whatnot's kind of unique. We, uh, we started the data stack around two years ago. The company was about 20 employees at the time. Um, we are, I think the figure's a little off. We're like somewhere between 350 and 400 employees now, just two years later. So we have seen an insane amount of growth over a very short period of time. Uh, and growth is great. It's been very good. But also, uh, it is not without issues, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about. So uh, this graph on the right-hand side, um, there's no y-axis, so it's not super useful, but you can take my word for it. Uh, this is the, the total number of events that we've seen come through our, um, our event system over the past couple years. And you can see the growth has just been massive. Uh, we have seen an explosion in the number of events that are coming through our event system. And so, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about kind of what happens when, when you do that, when you see this, this kind of growth. Um, so there's some problems. Uh, the first problem is that it kind of turns into the Wild West. Uh, imagine you are uh, a, an analyst, and it's your first day at Whatnot, and you get uh, access to Snowflake, and you log in, and you see that. Uh, all these different tables, they're not consistently named. Uh, what exactly they represent, it's not super clear. And it's just a little bit chaotic. Um, so that's, that's kind of a good symptom, I think, for the first problem. It just creates this really tough user experience where uh, it's, you, you need like a very high level of context to know what's going on here to like do your job well. So that's, that's kind of the, the first problem. Um, the, uh, the second problem uh, is on the event producer side. We found ourselves having a lot of the same conversations over and over again where engineers, uh, we, you know, we're a startup, we move exceptionally fast. Uh, and when we would ship new features, we'd have a lot of the same conversations. Oh, we want to build this thing. How should we log for it? Uh, it's kind of like this feature, and so maybe we should log in a similar way, but it's a little different, so maybe we shouldn't. And th the problem with this kind of conversation, if you have it too much, is like it just slows everybody down, and like data consumers don't always end up involved, and it's kind of just a tough situation. Um, so that's the second problem. The third, I don't love the word ownership in the context of data a lot of the time, but we kind of had an ownership problem where... Uh, software that emits events, it's just like any other software, right? Like it's going to have bugs, it's going to be wrong sometimes. And when you notice those issues, it's important that you get them fixed. And in order to get things fixed, you need to be able to trace them down to somebody who can fix them. Uh, so that was an issue that we noticed as well. Um, so yeah, we saw, we saw this happening and we felt it was a very big issue. So uh, we decided to do something about it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start very high level, and then I'm going to kind of go into the, into the weeds of what we did. Um, first thing we did is we made two very big decisions. The first big decision we made is we are going to unify all of our logging into one data highway. You are either doing it the way that we do it, or you're not. 
That was the first big decision. The second big decision is uh, we decided to come up with a standard structured schema around how you think about events. Uh, this format that we chose was actor, action, object, like user placed order or uh, system sent push notification, something like that. Um, and that helps a lot, right? Because it just accelerates conversations of when you're trying to do new things, uh, you can do them. You, you can do them quickly. It's not meant for 100% precision. There will always be things that kind of snake around that are a little different, but it it, it speeds up a lot. Um, so I'm actually going to go to the next slide because there's there's four components. What I've described now are, are sort of requirements and high level system things. Uh, they're not technical decisions. So uh, how do you how do you go about implementing something like this? Uh, well. Uh, let me talk about it over the diagram. I think that'll be a little bit easier. So what we have here is we have like a pretty typical architecture of like a, a data pipeline system, right? On the left-hand side, we have um, we have event producers. In the middle, we have uh, pipelines that sort of move data from one place to another. And on the right-hand side, we have event consumers. We just have Snowflake in here for now as our event consumers. In real life, we have more than that, but it's easy to just talk about it with it's just Snowflake. Um, so this is so this is the the sort of architecture of the system, and I mentioned there are four components that we built that sort of fit into this. The first component is uh, what we call common libraries uh, for the producers that create a consistent interface. Um, what this means is that basically in each of the event producers on the left hand side, we implemented uh, a library that allows the, like, it, it follows a common protocol so that if you're an engineer working in any of these repositories, you have the same experience, right, when you're trying to emit analytics events. Um, so that's that's the first piece. But of course, if we're having a common library, what is it that we expect people to do? Um, so that goes into the second piece, which is the shared schema. Um, that's that piece there at the bottom. So the, the shared schema is at the bottom. Uh, we use protobuf, um, and uh, there's two components to it. The first is just typical protobuf, the, the messages themselves. Uh, if you've not used protobuf before, it's just a data definition language or an interface definition language where you can describe how, um, the structure of how data should look. Um, and uh, so that's the first component is you just define the protobuf messages. The second component is uh, one of my personal favorite things about the system, which is code generation, uh, where you take that schema and you generate code out of it. And then that is how we connect the second, the second piece, the schema, to the first piece, which is the, the sort of common libraries that people use. Um, so the expectation then is that we, uh, we generate code based on this shared schema, we implement it in the producers, and uh, the libraries that we've built in that first step both expect and require us to use that uh, that code generation. So that's that's sort of how the step one and step two talk together. Um, now the third thing that we implement here is that ingestion pipeline in the middle. That's probably the the least exciting part of this. It's just receives data and makes sure it gets where it's going. Um, and then the fourth piece, uh, which is also a little interesting, is what we call the exposure. Um, and the exposure is just sort of, you can think of it as the downstream API that we expect uh, consumers to use. Um, we don't expose just raw data for everybody to use, um, most of the time at least. Um, what we do instead is we put a light sort of process layer in front of it, and that's what we expect uh, consumers to use. And that, um, yeah, and that's that's the exposure. Okay, this talk has been very high level and very architecture-y, and that was not my intention. So I think it would be very helpful if we go through an example. And while some of these ideas are, are, are high level and abstract, if you actually go, like, once you kind of have them settled, implementing this and operating within it in practice is actually not too bad. Um, so I think we can just walk through an example and you can kind of see in practice what, what, it ends up, uh, what it ends up looking and feeling like. So, uh, yeah, let's say we want to implement a, an analytics event for when a user follows another user, just typical uh, social network functionality, right? I want to follow another user on the app. So uh, there's three steps to follow. The first step is we declare a schema. Uh, you can see here we have a, a protobuf message as uh, the, the top thing. Uh, notice it follows that actor action object framework that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. User followed user. Um, it has some information, just IDs. Um, one thing that we require people to do is attach metadata to all of this information, descriptions, uh, like so we know what this event means. Um, and then uh, a team owner we attach to each event as well. So this is, this is step one. Uh, the second part uh, of this uh, first step is um, we take this event and we generate code out of it. Um, then once you have this code, you can move on to step two, which is you implement the producer. This is that client library that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, you can see here sort of in the middle, I don't think I have a pointer, but um, 
the user followed user event right there in the in the code. That is the the object that has been generated from the schema itself, and that gives us all kind of benefits. Like if the typing is wrong and stuff like that, then it the the code itself here won't work. Um, so that is uh, that is one of the big benefits that we like about the system. Um, yeah, and so this is this is the step two the uh, step two that we expect our event producers to go through. And uh, once they implement it in wherever uh, wherever they want, we'll talk about testing in a second uh, as well, um, they're pretty much done. So if you remember from that earlier slide, uh, we had all of those different tables and all this different stuff going on. The exposure layer that we have implemented uh, consolidates all of this into two tables, back-end events and front-end events. So we've really lowered the amount of context that you need to be able to jump into the system and understand what's going on. And uh, just some example queries that you can use to sort of like get a sense of how uh, how how this data becomes much easier to work with. Um, so yeah, those are that's just a concrete example. Um, just two quick things before before I wrap up. Um, so there's uh, as many of us I'm sure know the real world is very messy and things go wrong all the time. So how do we maintain quality and how do these contracts actually end up in like getting enforced in the real world? Um, so there's a couple different places. The, uh, the first is uh, we catch issues before they even get implemented. Um, when you make that first pull request, let me see if I can go back here, this one, um, when you propose schema changes, there's all kinds of automated checks that run in, uh, in the GitHub, uh, sorry, on your PR in the GitHub repo. Um, and it catches things like backwards incompatible changes. Uh, it catches things like, um, like improperly named fields, stuff like that. Um, and so that's the first place before we even implement anything. Uh, in the second, uh, the second place where we maintain quality is during development. As part of those common libraries, uh, we've uh, we've implemented sort of testing harnesses that people can just use freely to test their events and make sure that they uh, they work the way that you expect them to. So you don't just have to blindly ship code. You have like a testing library that you can use to make sure it's going to do what you want it to do. Um, and then third, again, even even with both of these, these these two will catch a lot of issues, but. You know, the, the real world, anything can happen. So uh, we have monitoring in flight as well that looks for particular exceptions. And we're, we're, uh, we're trying out some of the, um, some like in warehouse monitoring, uh, monitoring too, where you can look at anomaly checks and sort of like distributions of certain events that happen over time. We're, we're just getting started there, but we're, we're working more on it. Um, okay, so that was a lot. <laughs> um, just want to talk a little bit about learnings wrapping up here. Um, the first thing is about code generation. Um, code generation has been a like a huge thing that has paid for itself over and over again. Um, the real benefit that it gives you, like if you think about a lot of uh, data engineers, they'll spend a lot of their time fixing little issues that have kind of like crept their way into the data. And code generation can fix a lot of those things because it makes it exceedingly difficult to send data that is not in the format that you would expect it to in the very first place. So it goes, it kind of shifts the problem left extremely far and it, and it uh, yeah, and so I think it, it helps a lot there. Um, the second is like, this was a lot of work, and it it was uh, we we were lucky we were early enough in our journey to to be able to pull this off. So if you're thinking about implementing a system like this, recommend you start early. <laughs> um, and then finally is I think one of the things that we uh, that we uh, really benefited from uh, is we were really close to our users. We were really close to uh, the event producers and the event uh, consumers, um, and. Uh, you know, there are a lot of problems that we that we faced when we were building this thing, and I think we had the benefit of being able to talk to them in kind of a closed loop. And uh, yeah, I, I think that helped us solve a lot of issues really quickly, being able to talk with them a lot. Um, all right, so that's uh, all I got. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.